We have two presentations this evening. The first is Dr. Corey Murphy, superintendent of the Aiken County Public School District. I'd like to also introduce um, board chairman, Mr. Cam Nessel. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Murphy would like to discuss the educational capital improvement sales and use tax referendum on the November general election ballot. Dr. Murphy, will you come forward, please? Nice to see you. Good evening and thank you, Madam Mayor and uh, City Council members. I appreciate you all allowing us this opportunity to, uh, to share, we, to educate you on um, what we're proposing uh, should we be afforded the uh, successful vote of the penny sales tax? Before I begin, I did want to acknowledge the members of my team that have uh, stayed up late with me tonight to, to come out here and watch this presentation for about the 30th time. So uh, <laughs> over there we have Dr. Amy Edwards. She's our chief officer for academics. We have Ms. Jennifer Hart, and she is the chief of human resources, and also Mr. Eric Jeffcoat, who is assistant superintendent for uh, elementary schools, and you've already acknowledged our board chair, Mr. Cameron Nessel. So very quickly, I, I, I'm going to give you the abbreviated version uh, so it's not to take up too much more time this evening, but um, what's being proposed is a continuation of the current one cent sales tax uh, that will benefit the capital projects in Aiken County schools. And if those of you that have been in this community for much longer than I have can, can attest that very briefly in our in our history here, um, we had schools that were very unsightly and that were no longer uh, within their useful lifetime. And so uh, it was very hard. It was uh, having effects on bringing folks into the community, bringing businesses into the community because our schools were, were not places that we would really would like to have kids come in and, and call it a, a great educational environment. And that's what um, I would like to kind of show you what we've done in the past historically with the monies that were afforded us to, to, to rebuild our schools and what we intend to do should we be uh, allowed to continue this next go around. So the, these are just some quick snapshots of the schools that, that have received uh, the benefits from you all, uh, that, the community at large. So you see Aiken High School until recent history, I wanna say back as, um, as recently as 2014 was uh, definitely not in the, the condition it was in now. Uh, you see down at the lower left-hand corner, Lavelle McCampbell. Also, uh, North Augusta High School is at the bottom there. And then up top uh, on the right, you'll see Rich Primanetta, uh, Millbrook Elementary, and Hammond Hill Elementary. And these schools have all been beneficiaries of either the one-cent sales tax or the $9 million bond referendum uh, that, that preceded, uh, it came very shortly after the one-cent sales tax. And so the, the, the way we begin these presentations is to remind folks that there, there are no state or federal monies that are allocated to rebuild our schools. So that, it, that comes from local effort. And so folks say, you, you guys are receiving a lot of money. Why aren't you, you know, investing in the schools? We don't have a pot of money designed to do these capital outlay. The, the capital projects is what we're doing. So what we typically do is we'll, we'll um, issue bonds in the amount of 8% of the tax base of Aiken County, which it gets us about $20 million. Now, let's say as, as recently as, as the 90s, $20 million was enough to actually build schools on a recurring basis. I think uh, as, as late as 2000, 2005, you could build a nice elementary school for about $6 million. You could build a middle school for about $25 million and a high school for about $40 million. Uh, fast forward to today, the last quote we have on building a very modest sized elementary school is about $50 million. Mm -hmm. And so that $20 million annually, it would take multiple years just to build an elementary school, let alone a middle and high. So that $20 million that we get is, we can't really use it for building schools anymore. We try to use it to maintain our schools. Sounds like a lot of money, but when you consider that there are over 40 schools in Aiken County and the average roof uh, replacement cost right now, for a high school, they came in at about $3 million. And so you have seven high schools, uh, eight, eight schools in total, but seven actual high school buildings, most with uh, roofs that are need, in need of repair. And you look at the amount of elementary schools and middle schools, and you can see that money could be taken up just in roofing alone. We have plumbing issues, mm -hmm. HVAC issues, flooring issues, paint. Um, all, this, all these services have to be maintained out of the 8% money, the $20 million. And so we've been making it stretch. 
but as um as early as it was 1976 that was our very first time um, we had a, a referendum and that was a 30 mil vote and that was to create what was recently called the new schools which was uh, Midland Valley High School, uh, Silver Bluff High School, and, and South Aiken High School. And those were considered the new schools in the community. And they, they were built with the funds that were, um, were allocated in 1976. And so they were completed in 1980. And for, I guess, perspective, a school's useful life is built in about 50 years. So if we built our new schools in 1980, we were pretty much at the end of their useful term. And so that's why we, we have to find other funding sources. So in 2014, the first penny sales tax uh, came about and they were used to build some of the schools I uh, mentioned before. And then in 2018, the actual $90 million bond referendum to support the rest of the projects uh, it w was approved. Quick facts about the penny sales tax in 2014. Uh, it was approved on November 4th of 2014 and began collections in 2015 in March. Now, the money can only be spent on the products that were named on the referendum. So we're not allowed to just take that money and, and spend it on other schools that may be in dire need as well. And that's something we want to stress to the community when they see, hey, we we got this money coming in. Why can't we fix some of these other schools? We're not allowed to take the money that we asked the voters to fix schools ABC and fix school CDF or DEF. And so we have to make sure that money only is spent on voter approved projects. Uh, fortunately enough, you know, you had COVID in those years and one of the silver linings was that we were able to actually bring in more money than what we projected. We originally projected about $188 million, but we exceeded that by the ninth year of the 10 year project, the 10 year time. So we're actually looking at around 220, $216, $220 million that we collected from that one penny sales tax over the, the 10 year period. So. Um, now that also benefits not only those that, that have students in our schools, but people who don't even have the kids in the school because it goes to property tax relief. And so in that time, we, we've um, we've been able to relieve property $114 for every $100,000 of home value you have. And if it's a rental property, up to $172 for every $100,000 in homes. So there is something in it for everyone should it be um renewed and of course if it's not renewed it will sunset uh after the 10th year which is about february of 2025 and we no longer have that funding source to help build our schools just a little bit of a, a reminder of what happened or what we how we used the funds in the past so if you look at the upper right hand corner you can see the old lavelle mccampbell it was built in 1920. Uh, i already mentioned that the schools were built to last about 50 years and we were still on Lavelle McCampbell as recently as 27, 2016. And so you can kind of see we're, we've been getting a lot of bang for our buck out of these schools, but you can only stretch them so long. And then the new school, of course, it's a beautifully built school um, right there, uh, very close to the old site and right in front of Bird. And those sconces are a nod to the old school. They're actually the original sconces from the, the first school as well. Aiken High School was originally built in 1953, so we kind of entered our bonus years in the early 2000s, and we still held on to it until uh, very recently here. So uh, a beautiful campus was built there. Rich Spring Mineta, an interesting fact. Um, they, the, the original plan was to build Rich Spring Mineta using the 8% fund, but we were not able to take the entire $20 million because we have to maintain our schools. So we were going to do it piecemeal. The original completion date for Ridge Spring, Mineta Elementary, uh, Elementary, Middle, and High School, the campuses, all three of them, was 20, 2035, excuse me. So it would have taken all the way to 2035 to peel off those little piles of money to build Ridge Spring, Mineta Elementary, Middle, and High School. So that community has already been enjoying that school for the last two years. So that's some of the pr um, proceeds of the, the sales tax. North Augusta High School, which um, really, it's one of our, our, our jewels right now. I tell people, you know, they see North Augusta High School is considered one of our flagship schools in the area, and it's beautiful, but it was built using the exact same amount of money that Aiken High School was, roughly 68 to $70 million. What the problem is now, the price of that have escalated. We're planning on spending the exact same amount of money on our new projects, but the price won't go nearly as far in $24, $2024. Bonus projects. So 
Um, whenever we name our projects, there's typically contingency projects and it's hard to name like the fifth or the sixth project because you don't know how much the other projects are gonna cost. And so the original Career Center was a contingency project. And when I came on board in uh, 2020, we had about $16 million to spend on a Career Center. So it was really gonna be a facelift. Uh, not very much we could do with that money. But fortunately, um, our, 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 task, our, our state legislators, they really worked hard to help us get the, uh, the mock settlement money diverted here to Aiken County and that to the tune of $30 million. And we were able to add the 30 million to our original 16. So we have roughly $50 million. And, and another cost saving measure, we co-located or we are going to co-locate the new career center on the campus of Aiken Tech. So these are other cost saving measures that are gonna stretch very far for us. So we're, we're anticipating breaking ground on the new Aiken County Career Center, which was originally built in 1966 here in the coming months. So I showed you what we've done, but let me show you a little bit of what we still need to do. Um, there are a lot of needs that exist in the schools. Again, our, our new schools, some of the schools on this list are the new schools, South Aiken, Midland Valley, and Silver Bluff. They were built in the 80s. And so you can see in the first picture there, that's the stove that's in our culinary arts lab at Midland Valley. And that is not a, a commercial kitchen. That is a residential kitchen. And so our students are not being trained or exposed to what the industry standard is. And so that, that leads to less than desirable outcomes. We want them to have the exact same thing that the larger schools are having and the professional programs are having so they are more prepared when it's time to get out into the real world. Uh, you can see there the cheerleaders, they are finding spaces in the schools. There are no space in the schools to have um, cheerleading and wrestling and some other other secondary sports. And so they find places in the school. And so you really don't want them stacking up two students tall in a room that's not designed for it. They have to roll out the mat. And you can see here, sometimes they get around rolling out the mat. Sometimes they don't get around rolling out the mat. And so it's one of those things where we would definitely like to have that um, purpose-built space. Um, up there in the upper right-hand corner, you can see one of our welding labs. It's also being used for storage. And so the students are not able to actually operate in, in what we would like to say a clutter-free and, and professional environment. They're walking around lawn equipment or other things of that nature. In the bottom middle frame, you see Silver Bluff High School. And every time it rains, um, I think everyone in here is familiar with the South Carolina clay. And uh, that soil doesn't drain. It's a bowl. And it sits there and it stays there. And it makes the field conditions awful for a few days well after the storm has passed. And also uh, North Augusta Middle School, there's the, the way we ventilate the restrooms there. There's no active ventilation system there. So we have to open the windows, which is less than ideal in a, in a, in a young men's restroom. So the 2024 um, 1% sales tax, if passed, should generate about $398 million over 10 years. Now, again, we don't get to use all the $398 million because we spend 10% on property tax relief. So that leaves us about $90 million to do, I mean, 90% of that fund to do projects. And of the 90%, we typically like to bond out so we can jumpstart the projects, which means only 90% of the 90% is left. Our most conservative estimates give us about $285 million to spend over 10 years. Now, a third of that tax is generated from folks residing outside of the county. That's a huge deal. So when you travel to places like Myrtle Beach or Charleston, uh, those folks from Aiken, they're spending money in these towns. They have penny sales tax that actually build their schools. So we're taking Aiken dollars and helping to build schools in Myrtle Beach, Charleston, and Beaufort. So it would only be right for us to try to recapture some of those funds when they have and when we have our tourism uh, and folks come through our area. So one third of the penny sales tax comes from folks that are not actual taxpayers in Aiken County. So that's the absolute, it's, it's a little bit of a return on investment before we actually even get started with building uh, some of the projects there. A lot of folks think that the penny sales tax will increase their grocery bill. Your grocery bill will go up, but not due to the penny sales tax. It's, uh, it, it does not, the penny sales tax does not uh, affect unprepared food gasoline or most medications uh, that you have. And of course, whenever you see someone from Aiken County Schools talking about the penny sales tax, we are not trying to sway your vote. We're just trying to make sure we educate you as to what we would do if renewed. 
the question comes up a lot of times. Uh, what if you don't get the penny sales tax this time? Well, our next chance will be the next general um, election, which will be November of 2026. And we're estimating that I think we'd lose about 70 or $80 million between that time and collection. So that's money that just will never be recovered should we have a gap in, in renewing the sales tax. So we look at some of the projects that we're talking about. Again, uh, you have a, a quick snapshot of our conceptual drawings. I say conceptual because what we're going to show you tonight is not exhaustive. It is just a concept. We will not know exactly how far the monies will go until we get closer to bid time. And so when folks think that I have 10 pictures of South Aiken and only two pictures of Midland Valley, it doesn't mean South Aiken is going to get the lion's share of the, of the, the money. It just means that that architect has sent me better drawings. And so I'll just make sure I, I share that with you all tonight. We we'll begin with South Aiken High School, again, originally built in 1980. This is where I gave you that $3.3 million number. The roof is failing on South Aiken High School. Uh, they have several impromptu water features inside the hallways, which is not something that we would like to have. We're losing equipment, and, uh, you know, we roll out the trash cans. Uh, anytime that if the rain does not come directly straight down, the roof doesn't capture it. So if it's any driving force in the rain, it, it ends up inside the school. So we definitely need a roof, and that's to the tune of three and three point three to probably as high as four million dollars in some of the estimates there. Uh, the the facade of the school, in and of itself, it definitely does not. It's not as welcoming as you'd like to see. It's very underwhelming. Um, but that was the design language of the '80s, and so that's why you'll notice some similarities when I show you the next three schools. That's that design language you're seeing. Just we weren't looking at making schools. Um, welcoming and inviting and learning spaces. We were just trying to get them done and, and make sure they could uh, withstand actually uh, bombs at that point in time. Few more, few more pictures of inside the school. Again, you've seen the photographs with the students uh, finding places to, to, to have uh, rehearsals and practices there. You see the residential cooking gear and of course clutter in the lab spaces, um, the welding spaces. So Here's the picture that this is a conceptual, um, but I would like to show you that this is the design language that we'd like to have throughout all of Aiken County schools, which is a large welcoming entryway that's actually a security vestibule. And so um, if any of you have seen the new Wagner Sally High School that's here to open up in um, January, will officially open in January, you'll see that design language. So that's a safety vestibule that gives the school the ability to have one last look uh, at a guest before they allow them into the school proper. And that's what you see in there. Uh, not only that, but just a more inviting and uh, a, a majestic uh, entryway for the school itself. The hallways will be uh, wider and more opened up. Of course, whenever we add spaces, to the school, we also add classroom spaces, which add to capacity. We know that Aiken County is growing, and we know that we're going to have need for capacity in the future, so this will also help us address that as well. This is the surrendering of the Kate spaces. We talked about uh, some of the places that are not designed for what they're doing, welding, culinary arts. We'll have uh, industry standard spaces for our students to learn. athletic spaces as well. Um, right now, most of the high schools here can only host until the second round of playoffs when it comes to basketball. They have very small gyms. That's a lot of revenue that could come into our town should they get into the, the final rounds of the playoffs. And so we'll have playoff level venues and then we could also use those for other activities in the community as well. Silver Bluff, again, very common entry theme. Same situation with the roof, the roof is failing. Um, we patch it, we put a 20 by 20 patch on it, but water's kind of pervasive and it just moves to the next area. And so you can never completely patch a roof. And all these roofs are flat roofs and they just simply, um, we move the problem. We do not fix the problem. We don't have the monies to fix it without the, uh, the, the sales tax or some other outside source. That is the entryway to Silver Bluff High School. Once you get past that entry door, you are in Silver Bluff High School, period. So we'd like to have security vestibules at all of our schools. Same situations you'll see there, uh, lower uh, left-hand corner, ROTC being taught in a class not designed for ROTC. Storage in the hallways uh, near e exit uh, doors because it's just simply not designed for those spaces. 
tiny gym. That's a Silver Bluff is growing. It's a three-year high school now, and they're 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 growing as a high school. But we can't really host um, a large crowds in that gym. And then you can see some of the uh, when you see the pastel colors on the chairs, you know they're a little older, um, and they're they're small. Kids are just. Um, they aren't small anymore. And so we, we, we need to get new furniture in there as well. So these are just some of the reasons that show that the, the school has kind of outlived its usefulness in its current state. And this is the design language that we'd like to have. Again, security vestibules, open front entryways, and then we're also going to take some of those funds and utilize it for uh, increasing the capacity of the school as well as some of the culinary arts, K spaces, ROTC, and athletics. Midland Valley High School, and as you, uh, many of you recall, Midland Valley was the recipient of some of the uh, the $90 million bond referendum. We were able to add some classrooms just as recently as 2020, I believe. I was here when we finished that, that edition. But it was actually, as you see it on the screen, to the right of the screen, the rest of the school is as it was in 1980. And so they're, they're failing as well, the rest of that building. So we'd like to come back in and add um, some new spaces there. A big thing to consider also is when we talk about the growth in Aiken County, we know that a lot of the growth is centered towards North Augusta and Midland Valley area. If anyone drives up now Aiken Augusta Highway, you can see some of the, uh, the apartments, some of the homes coming up and the development over there. So we will desperately need capacity in that part of town. People say, well, we can add to Aiken, North Augusta High School. Actually, no, we can't. Uh, that school is completely landlocked and it's at the if you look around the edges of North Augusta High School, you see a cliff. Uh, it's, it's, it's nothing to add on to. And as it is now, there, is no, there are no parking spaces as it is. So if we add on anything else, we'll be basically taking parking. So more kids, less parking, that's a problem. So we really don't have a feasible way to add capacity to North Augusta High School. That's where Midland Valley comes in close enough school giant area that we own around that school so they can handle it the traffic can handle it i've been working with developers to talk about what the growth will look like in that region and so we uh, elected to add more capacity to midland valley high school right now they're roughly at 1500 students this addition will add another 400 students so that kind of future proofs us on that side of town as well same issues you're having there, cafeteria, the kids are kind of packed in there. Uh, the welding spaces are being used for everything and welding. Uh, they, they actually have to weld outside many times. And so you can see there a, a little canopy down there. So they'll take that canopy outside and do many of their welding jobs because it's just not enough space inside the building. So that's definitely less than ideal. And you can see the, um, the residential stove. This is a, uh, now you can see in the upper, the, the upper photograph, you can see the new wing we're proposing. And this will be the new front entry of Midland Valley High School. So where you see Valley Strong it on the right, that's the new addition that we were added in 20. But the rest of that school is that 1980s build. So we'll change, completely change the, the front entry way of Midland Valley while adding capacity to it. Also, as you walk into the school, uh, you see the more area and welcoming environment. And then this is another shot uh, from the, the, the left side of that front entryway uh, as they will be coming into that new wing of the school. North Augusta Middle School, this is one of our oldest schools that we're talking about here today. This was built in 1954. And uh, you can, uh, if you look closely, you can see the window air conditioning units there. Uh, it looks like an old Air Force hangar. Um, it's just uh, not a good design language uh, that was used there. This school, again, 1954, so we should have been leaving there around 2000, and we're still there. Now, they did also receive a considerable update on the back side of the school, but the front side is still being used, and it looks like this. You can see that ramp there that goes to the front door. Um, looks like it's ADA accommodating, but it's not because there is no curb cut. So if you drove up in a car and you got out, you were disabled in a wheelchair, the actual place to come from the driveway onto that sidewalk is about where that American flag is on this, this um, presentation here. It's well off to the left of that screen, well off. And so that person would have to start way down there and find themselves traveling down that sidewalk to get to the ramp. The school was built pre-ADA, and so it just isn't accommodating, and we find that unacceptable. <laughs> Same thing with some of the other, the other schools there. Um, 
water likes to go downhill and for some reason we built that school below grade and so all the water <laughs> tends to come down and the kids have to walk through that in order to get to the library uh, whenever it's raining you can see in the upper right hand corner those walls are lined with metal and metal is a great conductor of heat and cold not what you want when you're inside the building you want an insulator and so what happens is in the summer those classes are exceptionally hot in the winter they're exceptionally cold and that runs up energy costs uh, the reason we included the doors on here is because the doors should automatically shut and what's happening now because they're aging they don't shut they don't latch completely all the time and if you think about a school that has about 500 kids running in and out of doors each and every time that's an opportunity for a physical security violation and we don't want the safety of our schools to be compromised in any way and so we definitely need to get the new doors and i've already talked a little bit about the ventilation system so what we intend to do is take the front of North Augusta Middle School and make it the back and then bring the, the new building down on where the, the PE field is now. And what we'll do once we demolish the old front of the building, we will we'll make that the new PE practice field. So it's kind of an entire flip of that school to create a, a new facade and it's going to be a much more welcoming environment. And that will complete the, the, the renovation of that school because the other piece of the school that's not in green on the screen is what was already renovated. So we were able to get all that done uh, within that budget that we've already proposed. I spoke very briefly about the growth in Area 3 um, and in Area 2, excuse me, I'm saying Area 3, Area 2, in Midland Valley and North Augusta. And so when I say new Area 3 elementary school, it's referring to a new elementary school somewhere in the Midland Valley area. And so we already know that um, we have enough middle school capacity thanks to Highland Springs. Take, uh, we were able to create Highland Springs by removing kids from four other middle schools. So we have capacity to grow in the middle school area. Our elementary schools are already requesting mobile classrooms. And so we need to start thinking down the line. From trees to keys, from the time we decide to, to build a school to the time we get a, a set of keys for a school takes about two and a half years. So if we wait two and a half years, that means kids are going to be in portable classrooms and mobile classrooms for, for an awfully long time. And what we try to do is avoid that by planning for the growth in advance. And that's what you see here. Now, this school is going to be an elementary school for about 750 students, but it's also going to be built with the same design language that was used at Highland Springs. So Highland Springs is a middle school that we can add an elementary school to. This will be an elementary school that will be ready to add a middle school to in the future. And by building them with this language here, it, you save a lot of money because you're building a lot of common spaces. They'll be sharing cafeteria, sharing some gym space. And so it doesn't cost nearly as much as building two standalone buildings. This is just a little bit more of the interior of the, the school and the kind of the language that you'll see when you go inside of them. Contingency projects. Again, when you're dealing with projects that have not gone to bid and we, we don't know what the market's going to look like, we don't know how much money we're going to have left over. We also are estimating how much money is going to come in from the penny. We don't know what the economy is going to look like, but if there are monies left over, we're going to address the contingency projects only after the primary projects have reached substantial completion. We're not going to address any of the contingency projects while the other projects are going because it could cannibalize the funding, so we'll wait. But it, once we know that the projects are substantially complete, we plan on replacing roofs throughout the district. So that's what you see in that first picture there, just a ceiling. So we'll replace some of the roofs. The second picture on the top, you see this, a security vestibule. I believe that's Kennedy Middle School. So we're able to come in and retrofit some of these security vestibules. But um, again, with 40 schools and only about, I think 13 have a decent vestibule, we have a lot of schools that will need these vestibules. And so we'll use some of that money to, to retrofit the vestibules there. Um, down at the bottom, we have the way we built Bird, we could add a couple of classrooms to each corner of Bird, and so that could be a contingency project to add more elementary space. Gloverville Elementary School, um, right now it's one of our small elementary schools. It was actually designed for less than 200 kids, but there are about 350 kids there because they have a 13 mobiles, excuse me, 12 mobiles. So at any given day, you have more kids outside in mobile classrooms than there are inside in the building. The main hallways of the building are not air conditioned, and it's just one of our older facilities that's going to need a lot of love if we have um, 
contingency money. And lastly, Glover, I mean, uh, Grant, excuse me, Greendale Elementary, Gloverville, Graniteville, Greendale. Greendale uh, in, in area, uh, New Ellington, they're having, uh, it's just a, I don't want to use the word dilapidated. It is not a good looking school from the outside. Once you walk inside the school, other than some, uh, some issues with the roof, um, the school is actually in, in decent repair, but it, it was cobbled together. That school has uneven flooring, and there, there's a lot of needs at, at uh, Greendale that we'd love to address should we have the contingency funding. So when you go to vote, there is a ballot question in there that's going to ask you. There, there are two questions. The first question is, are you in favor of allowing the penny sales tax to renew? So again, there is a penny sales tax right now that goes on. So we're not asking for any new money, just a continuation for the next 10 years. Are you in favor, yes or no, to allow the penny sales tax to renew? And some of that other language spells out the primary projects plus the contingency projects. But very importantly, it's the secondary question. And now that is, are you in favor of allowing us to bond out money and so we can jumpstart the projects? If the companion question does not pass, then we have to wait until the pennies pile up and we'll have to do the project sequentially. If we're allowed to bond out some money, we can actually jumpstart the projects and use economy of scale. We can begin these projects almost simultaneously because we've procured enough vendors, enough companies, construction companies and architects to do the work. If you're ordering 10 generators, it costs a lot less if you're ordering two generators. You have economy of scale there. So we, we'd love to have that um, approved as well, not to exceed 90% of the projected value. So if we could bond out, we could jumpstart the projects and not have to wait several years. So we have been in the community um, telling folks as many times as we can, and we're still uh, up until the day of the vote, the day before the vote, we we'll, we're willing to share this QR code shows very much uh, the information I shared with you this evening. Uh, if anyone would like to visit that QR code, uh, we have a website up as well that is informational. Again, it's information on our website to show you what was done with the last penny sales tax, what we intend to do with the next penny sales tax. And it, it's, it's not designed to sway your vote. It's just designed to inform you of uh, what we would do should we be uh, afforded that opportunity. So with that, uh, I, I conclude this presentation and uh, I can take any questions should you have them. Dr. Murphy. Yes, ma'am. Excellent presentation. Um, two questions. Um, the Career Center will be built on the property of Aiken Tech, you said? Yes, ma'am. Is that land donated to the school district or purchased? No, it's actually a 50-year a lease with a 25-year renewal. And so, uh, of course, Aiken Tech is owned by the state, and so we had to go to their board and request a, a, the right to build on their property. One other question. I've been asking you ever since we started this. When is Greendale Elementary going to get a new school? Well, again, um, with, this, with this project, so the project, the, the, the process we used to eliminate basically the board came together mm -hmm. and we had a list of projects if we were to fund all the projects we'd need roughly 750 million dollars and so there is no there is no bond no penny sales tax that will get us there with the money so having 285 million dollars worth of funding and 780 million dollars worth of projects there had to be some 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 give and take this list of projects that we're showing you here is the best thinking of the school board as well as the information that we provided them so we were basically forced to decide which projects could get funded now what we're happy about is if the economy is strong and we're able to get good pricing on the, the first five projects greendale is one of the contingency projects so it will have an opportunity to get fixed then without this money greendale would be in a list of other schools that have several needs and so we would without this money here we would basically be trying to take that portion of the $20 million every year, fix the roofs at the high school. Then after a few years, fix whatever other problems I've shown you there. Then Greendale will be put on the list. And so that would, without the spending sales tax, I can tell you it would not be any time in the foreseeable future. Say that again? Without the penny sales tax, we, okay. don't, we would not have the uh, funding okay. to express I it. I thought you said winter. Okay. Just breaks my heart. Yes, I, I went to elementary school there. I walk in, 
it looks the exact same way it looked when I was there, yes, except for the gym. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh. Right. I have a question. Thank you for being with us this evening, yes, Dr. Murphy. Anticipated growth. You mentioned Wes. Mm -hmm. Are there other locations too? And, and do you have some idea of the enrollment that you can expect in the next three, five years with that growth pattern? I always tell people it's kind of like trying to, to, to hit a moving target, uh -huh. a, shoot a, a target that's on top of a train. Uh, it's not an exact science. We actually contracted with some folks that, that kind of gave us a demographic mm -hmm. study of where we're shifting. They show more of a shift and not an actual growth, but anecdotally we're seeing the growth itself. And so that's why we're, we're, we're planning based on um, zoning requests. We're planning based on where we see people coming in. So. I know uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that one day, one week at Bird Elementary, I think she received about, it was, it was upwards of 28 kids that, that we did not see coming. They just showed up there. And so if we aren't, if we aren't planning mm -hmm. right now for this type of growth, then we're gonna find ourselves putting a lot of mobiles out. Now, back in the day, we could order a mobile and have it in the, in, in, on the ground within about 30 days. Uh, we ordered the mobiles for Bird in February. And they're not there yet. So the process is it, right now you don't get to just pull, you know, attach the trailers to a dually and pull it out there anymore. No, you have to, they're built on site and they're, they go to the office of school facilities. So it takes a lot longer to build a portable class. It was well, not portable anymore. One of the mobile classrooms. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, if we don't plan now, we're going to have to rezone. And that's the only thing. And that's extremely unpopular with elementary students. It is. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.